Thanks, Patrick. We can see it's very easy to partner with companies like Castel when you have enthusiastic people like uh, Fiona and uh, also Linda here. It's been a pleasure working with them over the last 18 months now, at least we've been talking and probably a year into the partnership. What I want to talk today is build on the theme that we heard from, uh, from Fiona. And it's this whole concept of a social license and the roles that NGOs have in creating social license and at times destroying that social license. I won't comment too much on all that, that's, that's not the way we work. So what is a social license? Very simply, a social license to operate is ongoing acceptance from the community in which you work, live, and play. It's for the stakeholders who can affect your business. It's the acceptance that you have a place and a role in that community, and you're adding value to that community, whether it be economic, social, or environmental. If a sector doesn't have a social license, or it loses that social license, it very quickly is forced to operate in a world full of regulations and restrictions and a lack of certainty about its future and what it can and can't do. And there are two elements to social license. There are many elements if you actually read the academic li literature on this, but I think there are two key elements. The first is going beyond compliance with the law and legislation. And one thing that makes it so easy to work with a company like Tassel is they go well beyond what's required under law or under legislation to operate. Secondly, it's about getting along with stakeholders in a collaborative and constructive way. It sounds simple, but the more I read about this and the more I play in the space as an NGO, the more I begin to understand that social license isn't a complex uh, issue, but it's a very easy thing to get wrong. Let me illustrate this, and Patrick may tell me off for showing this slide, and although this is not about social license, I think it starts to tell some of the stories that the Australian seafood industry is challenged, is challenged with in terms of whether or not it has a social license to operate. In the slide, if I do my maths right, I think it's 73% uh, of the Australian public from the survey work done, I think it was in 2010 and published in 2011, so it's not too long ago, 73% of the Australian public did either, didn't know or didn't think that the Australian seafood industry was sustainable. So that's not social license per se, but it's very much part of the social license equation. And that's astounding to me, is that I can be amongst those who are critical of the seafood industry in Australia, it's part of my role to be critical, to bring about improvement, but to think that 73% of the population don't know or think it's unsustainable is astounding to me as somebody who operates in that space. And if you look more broadly at trust and institutions, uh, you know, and also it's interesting, Australian food is actually higher than other parts of the world when you look at these Eidelman surveys. And this is just trust institutions as a measure of social acceptance. You have business around 50%. Sorry to the media, you're not doing so well on this survey. You have government doing perhaps surprisingly well up there with business around over 50%. I think this is a, something that's quite unique to Australia and other parts of the world. Faith in government and business is lower. But then you have NGOs, and this is considered around the world, where their trust in what NGOs say and do whether it's deserved or not, is up around 63 to 65%. So that trust has a lot to do with the way you operate and, how you, and what you can say and what you can do and what, and what change you can make and how you can function in society. And I would argue, even though businesses seem to do well here, I would guess if you look at recent incidents with the uh, super trawler, look at the figures from the FIDC uh, survey, that the seafood industry in Australia is struggling with social license. But NGOs do this too. Social license is incredibly important to the way I operate. And I, I, won't, I don't want to focus on the seafood industry so much in this talk. I want to focus on the role that NGOs have in creating social license. Whether it's deserved or not, we're amongst the most trusted institutions in society, and we often lead opinion on issues such as health, human rights, and environment. It's just not environmental NGOs, it's the development NGOs, it's those working for women's rights, it's those working for health advocacy across, across the board. We're growing in number and influence. We raise awareness, provide advice and services, and influence public policy. We operate in the same way as industry associations do. We mirror the, way, the role that government departments have. We offer independent advice uh, to anyone who will listen to us. And we operate and partner with a wide range of people to bring about changes. And we have played a major role in shaping public expectations about the seafood industry. We've influenced both corporate perf uh, performance and behaviors, our partnerships with Tassel, uh, Coles, uh, John West, and Blackmores are part of influence and behavior. 
and we also work very closely with government and we engage the state and federal level and we make as many submissions as the rest of the uh, industry do on matters around uh, uh, fisheries policy, etc. But not all NGOs are the same. And I, be, be interested, uh, when I talk to people in the public, they tend to lump us all in together. So you lump government in together, or you lump the seafood industry all together, and we're not all the same. We're part of what's called civil society. You often sometimes hear us referred to as civil society organizations. And there's a whole range of, uh, uh, of these types of organizations, ranging from special interest groups to get together to pursue just one matter. And maybe the campaign around the super trawler is an example of a special interest NGO and a group of people come together to fight just one issue. Rightly or wrongly, they come together to fight one issue. At the other extreme, you have activists. Uh, there's probably a group of uh, uh, environmentalists down in the Southern Ocean at the moment chasing uh, ships that tend to be operating at the edge of uh, what's allowed under law and things like that. But they act very much as activists. So when you're working with NGOs or the role that NGOs play, is that we're not all the same, and we all play different roles in shaping public opinion. But all of these activities have proven to be effective, because if they weren't effective, we wouldn't be in business and doing as well as we are. I would be very uh, upfront and say that WWF sits right in the middle of this uh, diagram. It's a role we have for ourselves. We consider ourselves to be somewhere in the middle where we operate in a, a sphere of, uh, of attempting to influence and persuade and work with people to bring about change. We don't get involved in the, uh, in the interest, special interest groups too much, and we certainly don't get involved in um, the uh, uncivil uh, activities. It might be a bit exciting to have the police raiding our offices on occasion, but we don't have that happening, so life tends to be a bit boring if you work for WF. You want an exciting life, you want to get to know the police a bit better, go work for one of the other NGOs. Um, and just like the fishing industry or any other industry, super industry, we depend on trust and legitimacy. And that comes from being uh, independent of both government and of uh, industry. And one of the things that keeps me awake at night are our business partnerships at times, not because we don't believe in those business partnerships, but to make sure that we are staying independent and are not being captured by the interests of our business partners. When you work closer to a group like Tassel or Coles or John West or Blackmores, you can very quickly start to take on some of their language and ideas. And so we try very hard to remain independent, and there are many NGOs that will not engage or partner with businesses for that very reason. We do, but it's very much something we recognize is both an opportunity and a risk to us. We try and provide impartial information on controversial uh, issues, and it's often expected that an NGO, for whatever reason, whether this is right or wrong, will provide more impartial information on an issue than perhaps a government department or the industry will. Again, I'm not arguing whether this is right or not, I'm just arguing about the perception that's out there. NGOs uh, tend to have a bit of an argument. Uh, I always remember when I was working for, this, for, the, uh, for the fishing industry in New Zealand, I would be on Morning Report, the equivalent of the ABC morning show with a, uh, a pretty, uh, uh, I was gonna say vicious, the wrong word. Kim Hill was known to be able to take people apart very quickly. And one morning she was, we were talking about uh, an issue with bycatch of dolphins, and she said, well, Michael, you would say that you have a vested interest, whereas my colleague from the NGO movement, I obviously didn't have the same vested interest. And of course, that's not true. We all have uh, vested interests. But that person who was sitting on the other side and opposing me in that breakfast conversation had more professional and moral authority than I did, simply because she came from the NGO sector. It was a lesson, uh, quite an interesting lesson at the time. So trust is fragile and it's vulnerable. And many years are required for an NGO to create a good reputation and it takes one bad move to lose that reputation, or maybe two, you might get away with it once, you're certainly gonna get away with it twice. So I, I, I presented this slide, and I spent a bit of time on it, simply to suggest that NGOs in a very similar situation to the seafood industry. We depend upon trust and legitimacy, and therefore we have a common cause and, a co and, a, and, uh, and common goals. And the last comment I wanna make on our legitimacy is this quote that came from somebody who works for a uh, development NGO, Transparency International, from a few years ago, because we're often questioned where does our legitimacy of NGOs come from? Because we don't represent people. I don't represent anybody. Our representation, though, comes from the things that we do, from the validity of our ideas, by the values that we promote, and by the issues we care about. That's what gives us standing in the community and in the, and in the way we operate. And I think those very, very same uh, uh, comments could apply to the seafood uh, industry. So the best way we can work together to address this accountability challenge 
is to generate public trust by full transparency and high uh, standards of performance. And this is what CASEL has told you about in their presentation before. Going beyond that to address this accountability challenge by really creating uh, high levels of transparency and high standards of performance. It doesn't mean that every NGO or any other sector of the society will agree with you, but you have that transparency and those high set standards of performance. And I believe that the role of WWF and NGOs like myself here in Australia is very much to work with the seafood industry, uh, we're to evaluate and improve the seafood industry performance. We work very close with our market partners to do that. We mobilise joint resources at times to, uh, uh, to solve sustainability challenges. In the recent Queensland elections, we worked with the uh, Queensland Seafood Industry Association and with uh, Sunfish to uh, approach the government about getting a $10 million buyout for the net fisheries in Queensland. So it's the commercial sector, the recreational sector, and WF working together to bring about that commitment to a buyout in that fishery, to mobilise the resources to solve a real challenge, an economic, social, and environmental challenge. And working together to strengthen those public sector institutions and the capacity of those institutions to help us work together to solve those, uh, those challenges that are out there. As I start to conclude, as I said before, I don't think social license is that complicated. It's challenging to, to achieve and retain, but I don't think it's that complicated. I think it's very much a function of four things. The state of the stock, and we've started addressing those uh, in a number of government reports, so we do know about the state of our stocks. We have less information about ecosystem impacts. We can get that, but it's challenging to address those ecosystem impacts. It's about the quality and effectiveness of our fisheries management systems measured in economic, social, and ecological criteria. It's not just about the environmental outcomes, it's also about the social and economic outcomes in, uh, in those industrial sectors that matter as much to social license as the environmental outcomes. All three go together. And finally, it's about inclusive and transparent processes cognizance of those social dimensions and values and not dismissive of those. And sometimes we can all become somewhat dismissive of those different dimensions, particularly if they're in opposition to us. Uh, you know, it's better to take them head on, work with people, acknowledge their concerns, recognize their concerns. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but recognizing, acknowledging people and involving them in the process is very important. And too often we find processes where groups that are perceived to have a different opinion or a different value set are excluded from those discussions, so there's nothing to build social license. I would argue in the Australian super industry, we're starting to do one very well. We understand what the challenges are in two, but we need to work on three and four to really bring about uh, the conditions for social license. And as I said before, we are starting to do this. There's a group called the Common Language Group that uh, Patrick's organized, uh, uh, the FRDC has been very uh, happy to uh, help fund. Uh, it's been run by the industry and it's a group of uh, of NGOs, industry, government, and uh, recreational fishermen and aquaculturists come together to talk about the challenges we face in cre effectively creating social license for the seafood industry in Australia. And if we can collaborate successfully, and we're only on the beginning of that, of that journey towards collaboration, we will improve each other's performance. We will find innovative solutions to the challenges we face. And as I said before, they are ecological, social, and economic, and you can't uh, divorce those from each other. And if we are successful, and I think in the next five years we're going to be successful, we will have strengthened governance for our seafood sector, our performance will be improved, and the industry will have a much clearer social license to operate five years from now than it does at, at the uh, present time. Thank you. Thank you.